Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Tom O'Connor. I'm the fire chief with the city of Gladstone, Oregon. That's between Milwaukee and Oregon City, uh, which may mean nothing if you're from far away. But if you need a Harley or a Kia or a Toyota, that's the, that's the place to come. Um, I'm going to be talking about a term that I like to use called simulationitis, which is sort of training for the wrong things uh, in the fire service. So how to train for decision making. Um, here's a nice aerial photo of a, a recent fire in Gladstone, one of our arson fires, and the uh, power company was good enough to take that picture for us. So some problems I think we have with fire service training. Uh, the higher the rank, the less your decisions are challenged or examined. And I've experienced this as I've moved up in the ranks over the years, where people don't want to challenge you or you don't want to put yourself in a position to be challenged. So big departments, you know, battalion chiefs are out there having to make decisions, emergency decisions on scenes. And in a small department like mine, everybody, including the fire chief, could, could be an incident commander. So I need to practice those decision points. So uh, Chris Hadfield, you may know that name. He's a Canadian astronaut, pretty famous guy. Uh, he's the one who did the uh, Space Oddity video and filmed it playing the guitar on the space station. And Chris was kind of considered a master uh, spacewalk, spacewalker, instructor, uh, did a lot of time you know, in the simulation pool teaching people how to spacewalk. And he found uh, that he was pretty confident when he was sort of critiquing his own performance. And somebody finally called him out and said, hey, Mr. Spacewalk, I think you should have done this differently. And he realized later, because uh, astronauts, actually, that's part of their skill set, that they have to be able to take criticism. He realized that he was being unapproachable when it came to being critiqued. So he started asking for the critiques. Battalion chief and up, it's hard to get buy-in for true decision-making training because we don't want to look bad, or we're too busy, or you got to run the mail out to the other station. I mean, there's all these reasons that uh, battalion chiefs and up don't, don't maybe like to be put in those positions. And then we get in the situation where we think our own individual experiences are the most relevant. Now, they're certainly relevant to your experience base, and everybody's got those experiences. So if we can share them in training and design simulations to share that, then it's good for everybody. Because um, you know, I was the incident commander at a natural gas explosion in 2007 with several of our firefighters involved, one of them sitting here today. And I like to teach that class, and I like to talk about that stuff, because I feel like I have expertise now, and uh, I have passion for it. So not enough reps on decision making. We're really good at being task oriented in the fire service. But a lot of times, if we're going to say that we're going to do a drill where we're going to test the first due company officer, and uh, the first due company officer is going to have to make these decisions based on what they see. It turns into a hose reloading drill or an SCBA refilling drill. Maybe we get two or three repetitions. Maybe it's even the same company officer if we're doing well uh, in a couple hours. And they don't get a chance to do all those reps about the go, no go decision of rescue, no rescue, all those things that, that we expect people to, to be able to pull off. I think in our business, and some of you may disagree with me, I think that if we make mistakes in training, it's seen as weakness or incompetency. That guy goes into the shower after training, and, and we're at the kitchen table talking about how they screwed up in training. Um, I think that's a real weakness of ours. Uh, it's not what you're going to see on athletic teams, generally. Um, and I think a lot of us maybe have athletic backgrounds. So we want to be able to push ourselves and make mistakes to get better. And then here's one that you, you won't hear a fire chief saying too often, but I absolutely believe it's true. We, could, we don't use the lessons of EMS on the fire side. And so here I stand. I wore my uniform today because on this shoulder, I've got a paramedic patch. I've been a paramedic since 1993. Went through paramedic school, went through uh, uh, the classroom, clinicals, the internship, got hired at Corvallis Fire in 1993 and got hammered during probation. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of reps that I did on critical patient scenarios before they turned me loose, sort of. There was still another paramedic around in case I really screwed up. Become a company officer, become a battalion chief. How many battalion chiefs have got a chance to go through a three-month internship with another battalion chief and got a chance to ride alongside for a year, be critiqued, and, and it just doesn't happen in our business. And what's interesting is it's the same people. This patch forward, I understand that. Every year there's going to be protocol updates, we're going to do training, we're going to do reps on it. No, I'm a fire chief now, so I wouldn't say that I'm a great paramedic anymore, uh, but good enough. On this side, yeah, we haven't updated that protocol in like seven, eight years. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do what those Portland guys do. I mean, it's really interesting, and it's the same people, and we don't apply those same lessons. So yes, fire service, we can learn from the EMS side of things, because it is us. 
So what causes simulationitis? Well, lack of visual and audio clues to react to. We go to reading smoke classes, and we go to all these different classes, and, and we, we, we talk about what to look for, and then in the actual training, when we're trying to get people to read and react and decide, we don't provide the audio and visual clues. That's kind of interesting. Or we want people to remember all that stuff. So when you show up in your mind's eye, I want you to see this thick, roiling black smoke coming out of the Charlie side. Okay, so that's happening there. And then just pretend there's a mom over there who's screaming at you that her, that her kid's trapped. So remember all that stuff, okay? And, um, and then make, you know, make good decisions based on what you're, what, what you're doing. So you're, trying to, you're so busy trying to remember what you're supposed to remember that you can't actually decide because there's no clues for you. Or it's a false scenario. And we see that a lot where, especially if, you're, if, if the same instructor is teaching week after week after week, they kind of get tired of the regular scenario. So they're going to start up in the ante. And uh, I call it, I learned in paramedic school it was horses, not zebras. You actually, when you learn to read EKGs, look for the horses. Get, get good at identifying horses. And then at some point, there will be a zebra that may throw you. But don't spend so much time studying zebras when you really should know what a horse looks like and how to ride one and how to take care of one. This one is, is so true in our business, um, though we don't generally do it on the EMS side, once again, is that the person designing the scenario winds up being a decision maker in the scenario where everybody knows what's going to happen. So we execute a checklist beautifully, and everybody thinks, man, those guys nailed that. But there was no decision to make. We don't tell our paramedic students what the problem is with the patient. We expect them to figure it out and make a decision. And if you don't do that in training for a battalion chief or a first two company officer, how are they going to do it on the real thing at 3 in the morning? So we're going to talk about sports. Now, I'm a hockey coach and a lacrosse coach, and I play hockey. I'm not going to talk about those sports, because there's probably not a whole lot of lacrosse and hockey players out here. OK, thank you, Troy. Um, so I'll talk about football. OK? I know there's some football people in here. So individual skills. I'm going to talk about, I'll make some people happy and some not. I'm going to talk So Marcus Mariota by most accounts is a tremendous quarterback, certainly a tremendous college quarterback. Individual skills, he's tall, he's fast, he can throw accurate passes with velocity. Those are great individual skills to have. That doesn't make him a great quarterback. Team tactics, he needs to be able to throw to that receiver coming across the front, screen pass. So a team tactic, he needs to be able to execute that. Still doesn't make him a great quarterback. And then game strategy, they have a playbook, he knows the playbook, needs to know all the plays, needs to be able to execute them, but still doesn't make him a great quarterback. So what's the fire service equivalent of that? If somebody takes a saw up to the roof and knows how to operate it, they have the individual skill, that's great. They operate as a team and they're going to do vertical ventilation, that's great. Um, if that's the tactic that's employed in an offensive firefight, that's great. Mariota, he needs to know how to read the defense. He needs to know how to adjust. He needs to call an audible. That's what makes him a great quarterback. That's why Jonathan Smith, the little 5'10 guy for Oregon State, was a great quarterback, even though he didn't have all the physical tools of Marcus Mariota. It means he doesn't go to the NFL, but it means he knows how to read the defense and adjust. The company officer who's been tasked with vertical ventilation needs to know that this roof isn't safe anymore. He needs to know that the order was given three, four minutes ago is no longer valid and read and react to the situation. How many times do you provide a roof that's too soft to go on during vertical ventilation training? Mastery, influencing what happens next. When you're playing Marcus Mariota back in the college days, certainly, does the defense have to do, maybe act differently? Does he influence what the other team does? Absolutely. And can we influence what the fire does? Because that's our enemy. Can we show up with our two-man engine? Sorry, that happens, right? With our two-man engine, and are we going to knock it from the outside and then maybe put a fan up and go down the hallway and knock the room and contents fire? Are we influencing what the fire does next? Absolutely. Or we can smash the window too early and make the fire bigger because we're not ready. There's all kinds of things that, that you can do. So mastery of anything is influencing what happens next. Pushing to failure during practice is part of sports culture. I'm not talking about the physical stuff because we do it on the sports field and we certainly do it in fire training. Pushing to failure for decision points. Making it so difficult that eventually we fail. Maybe that's a play we shouldn't run. So I want to talk about NASA. I'm kind of a space buff. I love reading all the books. They're the master of simulations. 
because when they started this whole thing about going to the moon, they didn't have all these years of history of space travel. So they had to deliver and, and create simulations for things that had never been done before. So the simulation supervisor is a very, very important position in NASA. And they need to know as much as the people that they're creating the simulations for. And they have a whole team of simulators. Um, obviously, they have maybe some time and resources, and they prioritize it. And they are pushing those people in the mission control room. So some, some names you maybe know. You know uh, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong. Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, first man to walk on the moon, Buzz Aldrin the second. Gene Kranz, you probably know. Apollo 13 movie made him famous. The white vest, Ed Harris, played Gene Kranz. Um, there's a name you don't know, named Richard Coos. Coos was the simulation supervisor who prepared Kranz's team for the Apollo 11 mission, because Kranz's team also was in charge when they landed on the moon. Well, he thought Kranz's team was getting a little cocky. So on July 5th, Richard Coos pulls up simulation number 26, program alarms, obscure program alarms that maybe could make the, the lunar module computer lock up. And he loads it, and they run the simulation. And Kranz's team fails. They abort the mission when they shouldn't have. They panicked. They didn't have any mission rules written for it. And Kranz was mad, because this was supposed to be their last simulation before they actually went to the moon. And he wanted to land you know, on a high note, literally land, and have everybody feel good. So his team was not very happy with themselves. They wrote new mission rules. They talked to the computer people at MIT. And they figured out that these 1201, 1202 alarms were not abort conditions. This stuff they had to deal with. Sounds great. That damn simulation supervisor making our life difficult. About 3,000 feet off the moon on, on January 20th, Buzz Aldrin calls a 1202 program alarm. And then a 1201 program alarm. And their guidance officer is clearing these alarms all the way down to the surface of the moon. They land with about 10 seconds of fuel left with an active 1201 and 1202 program alarms going off. So if you think Kranz bought some beer for the simulation supervisor and his team, because we wouldn't be talking. Neil Armstrong wouldn't be famous for being the first man on the moon. They would have aborted if they hadn't run that simulation. So that's the importance of real decision points, because an abort decision is about a three-second decision. So training for decision making. So we think about sports. I'm sure there's several uh, former athletes or, or adult athletes in here. We don't expect players to excel without proper practice and lots of rep. It just kind of makes sense to us. And we shouldn't either. We give our paramedics lots of reps. We give our junior firefighters lots of reps. You know, granted, mostly on task stuff. Though paramedics have to decide, make complex decisions. Um, a lot of, some places do a good job with company officer decision making. Most places are terrible. Once you make battalion chief, eh, you pass the test. You must know what you're doing. We want to make sure that the sims are developed and supervised by the right people and take turns and share responsibility. Don't be the battalion chief sitting around with your other battalion chiefs complaining about the training division. Offer up to create a simulation. And the training folks can probably help you put that simulation together so that it's valid for the other guys, but take turns, trade out. Good sim work takes time and resources, and it's nice to have some of the software that's out there, um, but it's not necessary. You can have pictures of stuff when people arrive. You can throw a picture up on the windshield of the, of the engine when they arrive. You can certainly simulate the screaming parent, okay? The first time a screaming parent runs up probably to the engineer side of the engine, to say that my kid's inside, the first time that they face that, that your crew's face that, should not be at 3 in the morning on a real call. Keep secrets. If you're good at doing simulations, you need to keep it a secret so you can run the simulation and no one knows what's going to happen. We love to talk about how awesome we are at creating things and doing things in the fire service, but got to be quiet. Test decision making, not task competency. Okay? If we're testing lieutenants and we're testing battalion chiefs or response chiefs, it's not about how well the cross lay got pulled. Now, whether you're going to pull the cross lay at all, things like that, those are, those are different decisions. Or they're going to do a fog nozzle or a smooth bore, all those different decisions. I'm sure we'll hear more about that today. But the decision making, a go, no go decision, rescue, no rescue, offensive defenses, those are the decisions we want 
to train for. Get enough reps, talked about that earlier. Take the hoses, don't even pull the hoses. Just have a class with the company officers and have those guys get in the engine and maybe go to a scene, but don't worry about the hoses. Just keep going on those decision points. Repeat it 50 times instead of five. And the whole idea, and it's a, a phrase that I heard, I'm not sure if Ed Harton's in the room yet, but synthetic experience. That's the whole idea of training once we get beyond the task level is that there's enough synthetic experience out there that you learn from somebody else and that you're pushed for all those decision points when you have to do it on the real call, you've already done it a bunch of times. Marcus Mariota had to practice against the defense of the team that he was going to play the next Saturday. That's what he's doing now. It's only Sunday. That's what teams do. They, def they figure out what kind of defense the other team is going to run, and they throw it at the quarterback all week so he's seen it when he takes the field, and that's how you get excellence. So I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, if you want to know what a large metal-clad building full of 300 fiberglass and wooden boats looks like when it's on fire, Portland Fire would be glad to tell you. Uh, this is from February of this year, actually just upriver from my house. So that's actually a building. That's not a painting. It's not a Bob Ross painting. That's, a, uh, that's an, actual, an actual fire. So I'm not sure what that battalion chief's thinking. He's probably thinking some suppression thoughts here at this point, right? So that's, uh, you call in three fire boats and you throw an 8,000 GPM pump coming off the river. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive stuff. So I thought I'd throw that one up here. So that's what I have. Thanks for listening. And I'm looking forward to listening to everybody else. Thank you.